want to welcome you to Lord's Day Worship at Grace Presbyterian Church. My name is Ben Mearson, and I'm the pastor here at Grace. And I'm joined today by Douglas McLeath. Uh, he is a ruling elder here at Grace, and he will be presiding over the service with me. Uh, Rob Watson is also a ruling elder here at Grace, and he will be playing the piano. Uh, we are temporarily using this online video format until we can gather again for corporate worship. And in light of President Trump's extension of social distancing guidelines through the end of April, uh, the session has decided that we will not be meeting for corporate worship for this month. We will continue to post our video services online, including a Good Friday service. We uh, emailed out information about our midweek Bible studies and meetings that are being done online through Zoom. And I want to encourage you to join the online studies and meetings planned for this week. Um, I know that uh, connecting via video online you know, can never replace the blessing of us actually gathering together for study and fellowship, but it does help to keep us connected uh, during this time. Today is uh, Palm Sunday, wherein we remember Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem, the entry which marked the last few days of his earthly ministry. And you'll notice that many of the hymns this uh, service Focus on uh, this event and what it means for you and for me, what it means that Jesus entered into Jerusalem and knew that he would be facing the cross as a result. There's a link on our church's website with a PDF document of our order of worship. Please have that in front of you as we now begin uh, this service because the goal is not just for you to watch this worship service, but to enter into worship, to uh, unite with Christians across the world and with Christians already in glory, with the church triumphant, and with the angelic host, to unite with this glorious chorus in the worship of our triune God, our triune God who is holy, holy, holy. So let us now bow our heads as we prepare to worship him. Lord, as the deer longs for streams of water, our souls long for you. We thirst for you, the living God, and so we ask you to grant us focus and attention as we worship. Satisfy us with the joy that comes from knowing you and the assurance that comes by faith in the Lord Jesus, in whose name we now enter into your presence. Amen. Beloved, our help is in the name of the Lord who created the heavens and the earth. Amen. The Lord greets you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our call to worship this Lord's Day is Psalm 23. This is one of the most well-known psalms in the book of Psalms. It has brought comfort to countless Christians throughout the ages, as David reminds us here about God's loving care for his people. And so let us now read Psalm 23 responsively. I will read the regular text, and you will respond by reading the bold text. A Psalm of David. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not be in want. He, he makes, makes me lie, lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet, quiet waters. He restores my soul. He guides me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil, my cup overflows. Surely goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life. And 
and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Amen. We will now sing in response to God's calling us to worship by joining our voices in hymn 235, All Glory, Laud, and Honor. Now this hymn recounts the praises of the crowd as Jesus entered into Jerusalem. The people shouted, Hosanna, which is an expression of rejoicing in God's salvation. They also shouted, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the King of Israel. Greetings. Um, as we come into worship, uh, we acknowledge that our God is holy. Yet we are taught in Scripture that we are invited and we are accepted in Jesus Christ. Still, the Scriptures also teaches us that we should confess our sins. So now we come to our congregational confession of sins. And so look in your order of worship and join with me. Gracious God and Father, we confess that you are holy and perfect. We feel unworthy to enter into your presence because we again have failed to keep all your commandments. Our sins are shameful to us and offensive to you. All the wrongs that we have done are not hidden from you. Have mercy on us, O God according to your steadfast love and faithfulness. Cause us to walk in a manner worthy of the calling of which we have been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. We praise you for the assurance we have of forgiveness through the blood of our Savior, who lives and reigns with you in unity with the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Please take a moment for private confession. Father, thank you for hearing our prayers. In the name of Jesus, amen. Our assurance of forgiveness today is taken 
from the book of Psalms, chapter 32. Blessed is the one whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Blessed is the man against whom the Lord counts no iniquity, and in whose spirit there is no deceit. For when I kept silent, my bones wasted away through my groaning all day long. For day and night your hand was heavy upon me. My strength was dried up as by the heat of summer. I acknowledged you, I acknowledged my sin to you and did not cover my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord, and you forgave the iniquity of my sin. We now come to the adoration and praise section of our service and our first reading, which today will be Deuteronomy chapter 5, verse 6 through 21, and Matthew 22, verses 34 through 40. It is customary at Grace that on the first week of the month, we read the Ten Commandments, and we invite you to join with us. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself a carved image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is on the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them or serve them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing steadfast love to thousands of those who love me and keep my commandments. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. Observe the Sabbath day to keep it holy, as the Lord your God commanded you, Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, you or your son or your daughter or your male servant or your female servant or your ox or your donkey or any of your livestock or the sojourner who is within your gates, that your male servant and your female servant may rest as well as you. You shall remember that you were a slave in the land of Egypt, and the Lord your God brought you out from there with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm. Therefore, the Lord your God commanded you to keep the Sabbath day. Honor your father and your mother as the Lord your God commanded you, that your days may be long and that it may go well with you in the land that the Lord your God is giving you. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. And you shall not covet your neighbor's wife. And you shall not desire your neighbor's house, his field, or his male servant, or his female servant, his ox, or his donkey, or anything that is your neighbor's. Now turning to Matthew chapter 22. But when the Pharisees heard that he had silenced the Sadducees, they gathered together. And one of them, a lawyer, asked him a question to test him. Teacher, which is the great commandment in the law? And he said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the great command and first commandment, and a second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. Having heard, having been blessed with the reading of the word, we now will respond with our congregational response song, My Song is Love Unknown. That's hymn 182 in your hymnal. Uh, This hymn was written by a man named Samuel, Samuel Crossman in 1664. It is a hymn that over the centuries has been sung on Good Fridays. It was originally written as a poem 
And it's a very beautiful poem to Jesus with words such as the following. Love to the loveless shown so that they might lovely be. Hymn 182. Confession of Faith today is from the Westminster Shorter Catechism, questions 19 through 21. Uh, Grace is a confessional church, and it ascribes to the historical creeds, which it believes are uh, accurate summaries of Scripture, which is alone our authority. It has been said of the creeds, Creeds are true, are true to Scripture admirably served to tie generations of believers together by laying down a specific set of fundamental truths. Our confession of faith today deals with the state of men and how in God's sovereignty he has planned for our salvation. I will read the questions. Please join me by reading the answers. 
What is the misery of that estate into which man fell? All mankind, by their fall, lost communion with God, are under his wrath and curse, and so may be liable to all misery of this life, to death itself, and to the pains of hell forever. Did God leave mankind to perish in the estate of sin and misery? God, having out of his mere good pleasure for all eternity, elected some to everlasting life, did enter into a covenant of grace to deliver them out of the estate of sin and misery and to bring them into an estate of salvation by a redeemer. Who is the Redeemer of God's elect? The Redeemer of God's elect is the Lord Jesus Christ, who, being the eternal Son of God, became man, and so was and continues to be God and man in two distinct natures and one person forever. We come now to the part of our order of service where we usually take an offering um, that's part of our worship. And we encourage you, since we can't be together here, that you would employ the uh, means by either uh, mailing your offering or uh, using the facility on the website to give your offering. Please join me in prayer. Father, as we enter into this special week, we consider your love to us, a deep so love that you would send your son to take upon himself our punishment. And we look about us each day and we can readily see blessings upon blessings. Thank you for providing for us so graciously. We ask that you would keep us thinking right so that we would go through our days with gratitude and so that we would be strengthened to be your faithful servants. We pray these things in the name of our Savior, Jesus. Amen. Brothers and sisters, please join me now in the prayer that Jesus taught his disciples. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. I invite you to turn in your copy of Scripture to our second reading this Lord's Day, which is Psalm 107. Psalm 107 is a psalm of thanksgiving for the Lord's steadfast love to his people. It opens with a call to give thanks to the Lord, and then it describes four 
examples of God's steadfast love to his people. We will be referring to this psalm in today's sermon. So let us hear now God's holy, inerrant, and inspired word. O oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so, whom he has redeemed from trouble, and gathered in from the lands, from the east and from the west, from the north and from the south. Some wandered in desert wastes, finding no way to a city to dwell in, hungry and thirsty, their soul fainted within them. Then they cried to the Lord in their trouble, and he delivered them from their distress. He led them by a straight way till they reached a city to dwell in. Let them thank the Lord for his steadfast love and for his wondrous works to the children of man. For he satisfies the longing soul and the hungry soul he fills with good things. Some sat in darkness and in the shadow of death, prisoners in affliction and in irons, for they had rebelled against the words of God and spurned the counsel of the Most High. So he bowed their hearts down with hard labor. They fell down with none to help. Then they cried to the Lord in their trouble, and he delivered them from their distress. He brought them out of darkness and the shadow of death and burst their bonds apart. Let them thank the Lord for his steadfast love, for his wondrous works to the children of man. For he shatters the doors of bronze and cuts in two the bars of iron. Some were fools through their sinful ways and because of their iniquities suffered affliction. They loathed any kind of food and they drew near to the gates of death. Then they cried to the Lord in their trouble, and he delivered them from their distress. He sent out his word and healed them and delivered them from their destruction. Let them thank the Lord for his steadfast love, for his wondrous works to the children of man. And let them offer sacrifices of thanksgiving and tell of his deeds and songs of joy. Some went down to the sea in ships, doing business in the great waters. They saw the deeds of the Lord, his wondrous works in the deep. For he commanded and raised the stormy wind, which lifted up the waves of the sea. They mounted up to heaven. They went down to the depths. Their courage melted away in their evil plight. They reeled and staggered like drunken men and were at their wit's end. Then they cried to the Lord in their trouble, and he delivered them from their distress. He made the storm be still, and the waves of the sea were hushed. Then they were glad that the waters were quiet, and he brought them to their desired haven. Let them thank the Lord for his steadfast love, for his wondrous works to the children of man. Let them extol him in the congregation of the people, and praise him in the assembly of the elders. He turns rivers into a desert springs of water into thirsty ground, a fruitful land into a salty waste because of the evil of its inhabitants. He turns a desert into pools of water, a parched land into springs of water, and there he lets the hungry dwell and they establish a city to live in. They sow fields and plant vineyards and get a fruitful yield. By his blessing they multiply greatly and he does not let their livestock diminish. When they are diminished and brought low through oppression, evil, and sorrow, he pours contempt on princes and makes them wander in trackless wastes. But he raises up the needy out of affliction and makes their families like flocks. The upright see it and are glad, and all wickedness shuts its mouth. Whoever is wise, let him attend to these things. Let them consider the steadfast love of the Lord. Amen. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God endures forever. Our hymn of response to God's written word is hymn 650, I Will Sing of My Redeemer.
as many of you know, when we uh, gather for corporate worship at Grace, uh, one of the things I do is to uh, pray specifically and by name for the needs of church members. However, uh, since the pastoral prayer is now online, I won't mention specific requests. Instead, I want to encourage you to uh, use the home worship guide that's in the order of service, uh, along with our church directory to pray for one another uh, during the week, specifically uh, by name. So let us now go before our Heavenly Father in prayer. Lord, we give you thanks and praise with all that is within us. We give thanks to your name for your steadfast love and your faithfulness. We thank you that though you are high and exalted, you regard the lowly. That though we walk in the midst of trouble and danger, you stretch out your hand of protection and power. We find comfort, Lord, in knowing that only what you ordain will take place in our lives. That all that happens is by your sovereign will for our good and for your glory. And so we find comfort and peace in that, that though we now live in a very anxious and troubling time, we find assurance in your steadfast love to us in Christ. And so, Lord, we do not boast in our wisdom or in our riches or our strength, but we boast in this alone, that we know you, the one true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. And so, Father, as we think about this marvelous truth, help us to live lives that are worthy of the gospel. Help us, we pray, to flee from temptation and sin when it comes our way, just as you helped Joseph when he was tempted by Potiphar's wife. Help us also to remain steadfast to the truth and never to deny you, even in difficult times, just as you helped Daniel remain steadfast while he lived in Babylon. Help us also, we pray, to serve one another faithfully and joyfully, just as the Lord Jesus came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Help us to talk about Christ to our friends and family, especially during this time in which many are realizing uh, the brevity of life. Father, help us to live in this fallen world with wisdom, righteousness, and devotion to you while we look forward and hope to that wonderful day when the glory of our Savior Jesus Christ will be revealed. Thank you for the assurance of the gospel that he gave his life to free us from every kind of sin, to cleanse us and to make us your children. Lord, we pray for those in our church experiencing financial hardship as a result of this pandemic. Provide what each family and individual needs, trusting you for our daily bread and for the loving care that you give to each and every one of your children. We pray for those in our church who are most at risk during this pandemic. Strengthen them with your mighty power. Protect them, we pray, from danger and exposure. We pray for our covenant children and our teenagers, for their encouragement and peace in this anxious time. We pray, Lord, that you would cause each of our covenant children to trust in you with all their heart and to lean not on their own understanding. Work in their hearts by your spirit so that they acknowledge you in all their ways and they depend on you to show them which paths to take in life. Father, we pray for President Trump and all our leaders whom you have placed in authority over us. Lord, give them wisdom, steadiness. Lord, we know that this is a, an incredibly complex situation that our state and our nation is in. It's a, a situation that is affecting the whole world. So give our leaders the wisdom that is necessary to lead us well and to lead us in the fear of you. We pray also for the doctors and nurses and medical personnel working to treat the sick and those who are suffering. 
We thank you for their dedication, and Lord, we ask for your mercy upon uh, these very diligent people. And we pray, Father, now as we turn to your word, that you would grant us the illumination of your Holy Spirit, that we might understand your word as it is read and preached. We know that as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are your ways higher than our ways, and your thoughts higher than our thoughts. We need you, therefore, to give us understanding and insight and illumination. Without your spirit, we are blind and in darkness. And so give us your light, we pray. Give us eyes to see and ears to hear. For we ask in Jesus' name, amen. The sermon text for today is John chapter 6, verses 16 through 21, where John the evangelist records how Jesus walked on water. John chapter 6, verses 16 through 21. And there we read, When evening came, his disciples went down to the sea, got into a boat, and started across the sea to Capernaum. It was now dark, and Jesus had not yet come to them. The sea became rough because a strong wind was blowing. When they had rowed about three or four miles, they saw Jesus walking on the sea and coming near the boat, and they were frightened. But he said to them, It is I. Do not be afraid. Then they were glad to take him into the boat, and immediately the boat was at the land to which they were going. I want us to begin, as we consider this text, I want us to begin by asking, why was this miracle recorded here in John important? Why was it significant that Jesus was able to walk on water? And I ask that because it, this miracle that Jesus did, it, it didn't seem to, for example, immediately benefit a lot of people like Jesus' other miracles. For example, the way that he healed many people and cast out demons. In those situations, the benefit to those people was immediate because the sick were made well again, and those who were disturbed by the demons that were possessing them were then made in their right mind and were set free from that kind of uh, oppression and possession. And in those situations, we see the immediate result of, of Jesus' miraculous work. And Jesus walking on water then didn't seem to immediately benefit people in that same way. It also wasn't as public a miracle as some of the other things that Jesus did, like, for example, the feeding of the 5,000 plus women and children. That was a, a very public miracle. It was a sign to thousands and thousands of people of Jesus' glory. But when Jesus walked on water, we know that only his disciples saw it. So then why was it significant? Why does John the Evangelist, as well as Matthew and Luke, record how Jesus walked on the water? Well, friends, to find the answer, we need to consider the context of this passage. We need to consider where it is recorded in the Gospel of John. Notice that this miracle takes place after the feeding of the 5,000 plus women and children. And we know that in that miracle, which was identified as a sign by John the Evangelist, there we made two very important connections between Jesus and what God revealed about himself in the Old Testament when we considered this passage last week. We saw first that in the feeding of the 5,000, we saw how Jesus tested his people just as God did in the Old Testament. We read that Jesus, lifting up his eyes and seeing that a large crowd was coming toward him, he said to Philip, where are we to buy bread so that these people may eat? He said this to test him, for he himself knew what he would do. 
This is exactly what God did in the Old Testament after Israel fled from Egypt into the wilderness. The people were hungry and, and God tested them to see if they would trust him to provide. We read about what happened in Exodus chapter 16, verses 4 through 5. Then the Lord said to Moses, Behold, I am about to rain bread from heaven for you, and the people shall go out and gather a day's portion every day, that I may test them, whether they will walk in my law or not. On the sixth day, when they prepare what they bring in, it will be twice as much as they gather daily. And so we learned last week that Jesus tested his people, just as God did in the Old Testament. Jesus also fed his people, just as God did in the Old Testament. When Jesus multiplied the bread and fish, it was, it was an echo of how God in the Old Testament fed his people in the wilderness, just as we read from the book of Exodus. And now, in our sermon passage today, the Lord Jesus reveals another very important connection. See, friends, we're meant to see that Jesus has power over creation just as God did in the Old Testament. So that when Jesus walked on the water, he was demonstrating his power and authority over the created order, that he was able to control the seas, something that only God can do. And, and the idea here is that each of these serve as evidences of, of Jesus' true identity as the divine son of God. See, he, he was not just a teacher or just a prophet. No, he was the divine son of God. And, and each of these connections are pointing to Jesus' true identity. First century Jews, uh, they knew the scriptures. And for them, these connections were very obvious. See, when they saw Jesus feeding the people in the wilderness, they they saw then his divine power over the seas, the connections between what Jesus was doing in his ministry and, and what Yahweh did in the Old Testament were obvious. Jesus can do what only God can do. I think, think about us in America today. You know, if we saw a politician on TV uh, walk on a stage uh, wearing a black top hat, a black suit uh, with a beard. And he walked on stage and he began his speech by saying, four score and seven years ago, our fathers brought forth on this continent a new nation. You know, we, we would immediately, as Americans, we would recognize that this politician was connecting himself with Abraham Lincoln. That, that he was demonstrating that his thinking and his policies were in line with Lincoln's. This is, this is what Jesus' ministry was like in the first century to those who lived in Israel. See, his, his actions and, and his words were immediately recognized by those around him as being the words of God. The God that they knew from the scriptures what we call the Old Testament. Because Jesus talked like Yahweh. He did the works of Yahweh. And, and all of this revealed him to be the true divine Son of God. You remember that Jesus said this very thing in John chapter 5, verses 19 through 20. He said there, Truly, truly, I say to you, the Son can do nothing of his own accord, but only what he sees the Father doing. For whatever the Father does, that the Son does likewise. For the Father loves the Son and shows him all that he himself is doing. Friends, all of this, all this is meant to drive us to worship Christ and to trust in him for life everlasting. And we see first in our sermon passage, that the Lord ordains the storm. The Lord ordains the storm. We read in John chapter 6, beginning of verse 16, 
that when evening came, his disciples went down to the sea, got into a boat, and started across the sea to Capernaum. It was now dark, and Jesus had not yet come to them. The sea became rough because a strong wind was blowing. Now, in the parallel passages found in the Gospels of Matthew and and Mark, we see that it was Jesus who compelled the disciples to get into the boat and to cross the sea. It's not not as though the disciples themselves thought it would be a good idea to go. Instead, we see that Jesus made them get into the boat and cross the sea. We read in Matthew chapter 14, this same accounts, beginning at verse 22. Immediately, Jesus made the disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side while he dismissed the crowds. And after he had dismissed the crowds, he went up on the mountain by himself to pray. When evening came, he was there alone, but the boat by this time was a long way from the land, beaten by the waves, for the wind was against them. And in Mark's recording of this event, we read in Mark chapter 6, beginning at verse 45, immediately Jesus made his disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side, to Bethsaida, while he dismissed the crowd. And after he had taken leave of them, he went up on the mountain to pray. And when evening came, the boat was out on the sea and He was alone on the land, and they saw that they were making headway painfully, for the wind was against them. And about the fourth watch of the night, he came to them, walking on the sea. Loved ones, we notice in both of these passages from Matthew and Mark that this was all by the design of the Lord. We see that the Lord Jesus used this occasion to teach his disciples about their dependence upon him as the Lord of glory. For the disciples themselves, this this storm was terrifying. But the Lord Jesus knew what he was doing. He was using the storm to sanctify his disciples. And actually, this account in our passage today, it, it helps to dispel three errors that some Christians believe about God and our suffering. It dispels three very dangerous ways of misreading the Bible. Now, the first error is that God has no power over our suffering or the bad things that happen in this life. Now, this is a very serious error. And we see from this story and and so many others in the Bible that God is, in fact, in complete control. The fact that Jesus compelled his disciples to get into the boat and then walked to them reveals that God has complete authority over the events of our lives. What happened to the disciples did not catch Jesus by surprise. The second error is is that bad things only happen to us when we are being disobedient. You may have heard some saying this, that bad things only happen to us when we are being disobedient. The idea is that if we're good, God will bless us. But if we're not being blessed, well, it's because of something bad that we've done. And and so God is punishing us for it. But we see, loved ones, in our text that the disciples were obeying Jesus' direct command. See, they they weren't being disobedient. They obeyed his instructions and got into the boat just as he had told them. The third error is that belief, uh, is the belief that if we could just get some kind of mountaintop great spiritual experience with God, if we could just experience something like that, well, then all of our suffering and pain would disappear. You know, if, I could, if I could just have some ecstatic experience or, or some revelation from God, that would solve the problem of pain. But 
Loved ones, when, when did this storm come about in the disciples' life? It's right after they witnessed one of the greatest signs, the feeding of the large crowd. It was right after they helped distribute the bread and fish that Jesus had multiplied right before their eyes. What a glorious experience for the disciples. And yet, right after, they were enveloped by a storm. And friends, we know that it's in the midst of the storms that come into our lives, perhaps the death of a loved one or unemployment or the current pandemic and and the difficulties that it's bringing to each and every one of us. It's in the midst of the storms that we often ask, why, God, why is this happening to me? Why are you doing this to me? And, and what are you doing through this difficulty in my life? What are you accomplishing, O oh Lord? And it's in those moments, in those times, that we need to know and believe, loved ones, that God is our Heavenly Father, that He is all-wise and all-knowing, and that He loves us in Christ. And so even though our minds might not be able to understand fully what God is doing and why, just as the disciples were fearful on the sea that night, we can trust that God knows what He is doing, and He knows what He is doing far better than we know and that we can ever do. D.A. Carson, he provides a, a helpful explanation of our own limitations in, in understanding uh, God's wisdom and ways. Now, this is a quote that, that we've considered before. Carson writes, In any suffering or, or difficulty or event that arises, God is doubtless doing many things, perhaps thousands of things, millions of things, even if we can sometimes only detect two or three. For example, a Christian woman in her middle years is diagnosed with a terminal disease. Now, what is God doing? Carson, he says, my little brain can imagine several possibilities. At one level, God may be providentially allowing the effects of the fall to take their course, a constant reminder that it is appointed for all of us to die and then to face judgment. He may be preparing this woman for eternity. It is a great grace to know when you are going to die and thereby to be able to prepare for it. He may be shocking her 20-year-old son who is living his life indifferent to the gospel to prod him into self-examination and, and repentance. God may use her testimony about the joy of the Lord even in the midst of suffering to call another of her children into vocational ministry. He, he may be using her as a way to teach people in her church what it looks like to die well anticipating several other deaths in, in the next two years. Perhaps her funeral will be used by God to bring several of her unconverted relatives to faith, relatives that she has been praying for, conversions for which she would happily give her life. Perhaps she is hiding some deep bitterness and hate in her life, and God is using this means this illness in her life to confront her and to sanctify her. As we read in Romans chapter 5, verses 3 through 4, that for the Christian, suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope. See, Carson says, I've barely started a list of possible things God may be doing, and I have a small brain. What does the omniscient God think he is doing? In other words, sometimes we have to cover our mouths and confess in faith that we cannot possibly grasp all that God is doing when someone suffers, when the storms of life come upon us. What we know 
is that God is trustworthy, that he is the Lord over our lives, and he sent his son to suffer for our sins. Friends, we, we can rest knowing that God has a purposeful design in our suffering. It's never random or unforeseen, but always according to God's good purposes. And so as Christians, we can say with full assurance that whatever my God ordains is right. There's a hymn with that title in our hymnal. And one of the stanzas reads, Whatever my God ordains is right, his holy will abideth. I will be still whatever he does and follow where he guideth. He is my God, though dark my road. He holds me that I shall not fall. Therefore to him I leave it all. So we see in our passage that the Lord ordains the storm. We also see that he is present with us in the storm. He is present with us in the storm. We read in John chapter 6, verses 18 through 19 of our passage today. The sea became rough because a strong wind was blowing. When they had rowed about three or four miles, they saw Jesus walking on the sea and coming near the boat, and they were frightened. Now, it might seem at first that Jesus had forgotten them, that he sent them into the storm and then went off on his own to pray. And yet we learn, loved ones, from Mark's account that he was looking out for his disciples the whole time. His gaze never left them. Mark explains, Jesus saw that they were making headway painfully, for the wind was against them. And about the fourth watch of the night, he came to them walking on the sea. While the disciples might have felt that they were alone, that Jesus had left them, we see the reality was that he was watching them and thereby present with them. And, and then when he got into the boat with them, he demonstrated his abiding presence with them. In Psalm 139, verses 7 through 12, David speaks about the comfort of knowing God's presence with us. We read, Where shall I go from your spirit, or where shall I flee from your presence? If I ascend to heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in shale, you are there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there your hand shall lead me and your right hand shall hold me. If I say, surely the darkness shall cover me and the light be, uh, about me be night, even the darkness is not dark to you. The night is bright as the day, for darkness is as light with you. And so, Christ was demonstrating this same watchfulness and care for his disciples, the watchfulness and care that God demonstrated to his people in the Old Testament, that, that David speaks about in he, this uh, psalm. As Christians, loved ones, we take comfort in knowing that Christ is present with us now. As he ascended into heaven after his resurrection, we read in Matthew chapter 28, verse 20, that Jesus assured his disciples, his disciples that were fearful about the fact that he was leaving them, he assured them by saying, Behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. And so Christ is with us now, not physically present as he was during those three years of ministry with his disciples, but Christ is present with us through his Holy Spirit, through the Spirit who unites us to Christ. And so Jesus is with us through the work of the Spirit. And this is a fulfillment of 
the new covenant promises that we read in the prophets. We read, for example, in Ezekiel chapter 36, verses 26 through 27, this wonderful promise of God, a promise that speaks of the new covenant. And I will give you a new heart and a new spirit I will put within you. And I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and be careful to obey my rules. And so whatever storms we encounter in life, loved ones, we are assured that the Lord is with us because his presence, as we see here, never leaves us. He is present with believers in a very special way. He is tender and compassionate toward us, promising to sustain us to the very end. We especially see our Lord's tenderness and compassion and his saving of the disciple Peter. Because in the parallel account of this passage in Matthew chapter 14, verses 26 through 33, we read about how Jesus called Peter out onto the water with him. Matthew chapter 14, beginning at verse 26. But when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were terrified and said, it is a ghost. And they cried out in fear. But immediately Jesus spoke to them saying, take heart, it is I, do not be afraid. And Peter answered him, Lord, if it is you, Command me to come to you on the water. He said, Come. So Peter got out of the boat and walked on the water and came to Jesus. But when he saw the wind, he was afraid and beginning to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me. Jesus immediately reached out his hand and took hold of him, saying to him, O you of little faith, why do you doubt? And when they got into the boat, the wind ceased. And those in the boat worshipped him, saying, Truly, you are the Son of God. We see that Peter initially showed great boldness and faith, saying, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. But then we read that as Peter heard the wind and felt around him the power of the waves, he began to doubt and to fear, and so he began to sink and he cried out to Jesus and we read that Jesus immediately reached out his hand and took hold of him. Now when the Lord Jesus reached out his hand and lifted Peter up, he saved Peter from drowning and and death. Jesus' hand was like the mighty hand and outstretched arm of God that delivered Noah and his family from the deadly floodwaters, like the mighty hand and outstretched arm that delivered Israel from the judgment waters of the Red Sea. In the same way, Jesus' mighty hand and outstretched arm delivered Peter from the stormy waters of the sea. When Jesus saved Peter from death, the Lord Jesus was physically demonstrating what he does for each and every one of his people spiritually. He will never let his people drown in the waters of judgment, loved ones. No, he he is present with us, and he will sustain us to the very end. Not only is he powerful enough to do so, but he is willing and able to do so because he loves us. And thirdly, we see in our passage that he is Lord over the storm. He is Lord over the storm. We read in John chapter 6, our passage today, beginning of verse 20. Jesus said to them, It is I, do not be afraid. Then they were glad to take him into the boat, and immediately the boat was at the land to which they were going. Now when Jesus said, It is I, in the Greek it's a go and me, which is the translation of the name Yahweh, the name that God gave to Moses at the burning bush in Exodus chapter 3, verse 14. I am, said Jesus, taking the name of the Lord before his disciples. I am, do not be afraid. See, Jesus here did 
what only God could do. He commanded the sea. Now, there are many connections back to the Old Testament where where God is described as sovereign over the chaotic waters of the sea. Uh, Seas in the Old Testament represented chaos, disorder, power, and the fact that only God could subdue the seas revealed God's great power and might. We read, for example, in Exodus chapter 14, verses 21 through 22, how God divided the waters of the Red Sea, a great miracle that only the Lord could do. We read, then Moses stretched out his hand over the sea and the Lord drove the sea back by a strong east wind all night and made the sea dry land and the waters were divided. And the people of Israel went into the midst of the sea on dry ground, the waters being a wall to them on their right hand and on their left. For the Israelites, the seas represented chaos and, and danger and God alone could subdue the waters. God alone had the power and the authority to do so. Job confesses this very thing. Job, when he's describing the Lord's power in chapter 9, verses 1 through 8, we read there, Job answered and said, Truly, I know that it is so. But how can a man be in the right before God? If one wished to contend with him, one could not answer him once in a thousand times. He is wise in heart and mighty in strength. Who has hardened himself against him and succeeded? He who removes mountains and they know it not. When he overturns them in his anger, who shakes the earth out of its place and its pillars tremble. Who commands the sun and it does not rise. Who seals up the stars who alone stretched out the heavens and trampled the waves of the sea. In Psalm 107, verses 23 through 32, again describes God's mighty power over the seas. We read this psalm for our second reading today. We read in Psalm 107, beginning of verse 23, Some went down to the sea in ships, doing business on the great waters. They saw the deeds of the Lord, his wondrous works in the deep. For he commanded and raised the stormy wind, which lifted up the waves of the sea. This is describing a great storm at sea. And then verse 26, they mounted up to heaven. They went down to the depths. Their courage melted away in their evil plight. They reeled and staggered like drunken men and were at their wit's end. They cried to the Lord in their trouble, and he delivered them from their distress. He made the storm be still, and the waves of the sea were hushed. Then they were glad that the waters were quiet, and he brought them to their desired haven. See, loved ones, if God alone can command the sea, as recorded in Exodus and in Job and Psalm 107. And Jesus is able to do the same. John wants us to see that Jesus is God, that he is the great I am, and to therefore put our faith and trust in him so that we might be saved. Because, loved ones, in Jesus, we have one who endured God's stormy wrath for our sins. He, he bore the curse of God's wrath for sin so that you and I might receive blessing and peace. J.V. Fesco writes, when we pray, we ought to look to passages such as John chapter 6, verses 16 through 21, and praise Christ for his power to tread on the sea for his power over the creation, whether the wind or the waves, and because he is Yahweh, God in the flesh. Moreover, we should read a passage such as this and see 
it as a signpost to the certainty and faithfulness of Christ's great work of redemption. Have we ever doubted Christ's faithfulness? Have we ever allowed the circumstances or trials of life to drown us in feelings of hopelessness or despair? In the face of such things, whether frustrations, illnesses, persecutions, or struggles, remember that Christ has not abandoned us. Not only has he delivered us from the miry depths of sin and death, but he also watches over us every step of the way so that he will most assuredly bring us to our destination. Christ will plant our feet on the shore of the new heavens and the new earth. Amen. Let us pray. Gracious God, we thank you for this wonderful assurance that we read in your word that as we do experience many storms in life, troubles and difficulties, we rest in the assurance that you, O oh Lord, are with us always. We take comfort in remembering this day, not just your work in creation, but especially your work in salvation, that in Christ you have been gracious and, and merciful to us. We thank you that by his death, we are not only made better, but we are made new. That the old has passed away, the new has come. And we have been brought from death to life, from darkness to light. We ask you, Lord, to write your word on our hearts. You have declared that while the grass withers and the flowers fall, your word endures forever. And so grant that the word that we have heard preached this day will not be uh, snatched away by the evil one or fall on hard, unrepentant hearts, nor be choked by the cares and worries of this life. But soften our hearts, we pray, that we may truly profit from the word, growing in grace and knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Watch over us this week. Cause us to rest in your powerful loving care, for we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. I invite you now to join me in singing our hymn of thanksgiving, which is hymn 307, Nothing But the Blood of Jesus.
Loved ones, receive now the blessing from your triune God. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God the Father and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. Thank you.